Hi everybody, this is Manu and today we are going to start with the context-free grammars. Let's do it! Great! Remember that we saw regular languages we saw automata, deterministic, and non-deterministic, and we saw regular expressions, and we saw that all these three models are equivalent, okay? But they also have some limitations. And today we are going to move forward to a stronger, more powerful, more expressive computational model, um, specifically context-free grammars, and later we're going to see also that they're equivalent to push down automata and together uh, they um, recognize what's called context-free languages. So let's start with a motivation. Recall that we saw that this language here, the language of strings zero to the n, one to the n, for some n is not regular. How do we prove that? We use the pumping lemma. Okay? There are other proofs, but we saw the pumping lemma. However, this is such a basic language and very similar things are needed in many programming languages. Okay, For example, you may have matching brackets. If you think of matching brackets, a special case is that you open a bracket, open a bracket, open a bracket, close, close, close. So this would be like matching uh, zeros and ones. Uh, the zeros have to be on the left of the ones and they have to be in the same number. Someone has to recognize if this um, uh, text is uh, you know, written correctly. If you have the same number of open brackets and closed brackets, okay? And a DFA cannot do it, okay? So we're going to introduce context-free languages and show that they can do it. Okay, so there was just one motivation, but why else are we studying uh, context-free languages? Okay, we're going to practice. Okay, we like to practice math. You can think of this also as a playground for you know developing mathematical maturity. So we're going to practice with a more powerful uh, model. This is one reason. Uh, another reason, as I just mentioned, that the syntax of many uh, widespread programming languages like C++, Java, and so on is specified with a context-free grammar. Okay, is a context-free language. So the compiler needs to understand the structure of what you program, and it does that with a context-free grammar. It could not do that with a DFA because the structure of programming languages cannot be captured by a DFA. And there are other reasons. Um, you may also be interested in studying a human language. Okay, well, a human language has structures that are kind of like matching brackets and that cannot be modeled as a regular language, but can be modeled as a context-free language. Okay, and in particular, uh, you know, catchy phrase is that uh, the English language is not a regular language, but it's context-free. Okay, let's see an example. And here is a context-free grammar. As usual, it's good to start with an example and then move on to the formal definition, which is going to come in just a second. So here is a, a context-free grammar G over the input alphabet the sigma uh, zero, uh, 01. Okay, it has some substitution rules, which are also known as productions, which um, are denoted with uh, an arrow. To the left of the arrow, you have variables. In this case, you have S is a variable. Uh, and to the right, you have some combination of variables and what's called terminals, which are just elements from sigma. Terminals because you don't apply rules or substitutions to the, ter the terminals, okay? They are like the terminal end of the derivation. So here is how you would derive the string 0011 in the grammar. 
you start with the uh, start variable s, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you apply one rule, zero goes to S1. So you're going to replace this S with a zero S1. And now you're allowed to look at this S here and apply another rule to that. And that will give you um, zero S1 for this occurrence here or of S and to the left and to the right, we have the old symbols. And finally, I want to get rid of S. So I apply the second rule. This S goes to epsilon, the epsilon string. That removes epsilon, I just get a string 0011. This is a string just made of terminals. It's over the input alphabet. Um, and that's what I want, okay? So the language of this grammar is denoted by L of G, is indeed the set of strings 0 to the n, 1 to the n, okay? Because you can apply this first rule as many times as you want, and then you can remove the S. Okay. Here is an another example. Here is another context-free grammar. And now you have multiple variables. Okay, You may have more than one variable. Here you have the variable S, you have the variable A, and the variable B. And you have a bunch of rules. So at the beginning, S can go to A, or S can go to B. And then A uh, does the same thing that we were doing before. This is going to generate 0 to the n, 1 to the n. And B does also a similar thing, but with 1 and 0 swap. So this is going to, to generate 1 to the n, 0 to the n. Okay? So if you think about that, the language of this grammar, in the beginning, you have a choice. You start with S every time. In the beginning, you have a choice. So you either do the language of A or the language of B. The language of A is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, and the language of B is 1, one to the n, 0 to the n. Okay? So you will have strings like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, but also uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. All these things are strings in this language. Okay? Just like for the FAs, it's good to have some conventions that allow us to write grammars more compactly. Okay, so instead of writing uh, multiple rules, uh, okay, we write a single rule, but we separate the right hand sides with the vertical bar. So if I write A goes to W or W prime, you have a rule A goes to W and another rule A goes to W prime. So this allows me to write this um, grammar from before more compactly. Here is now a formal definition of a context-free grammar. Okay? A context-free grammar, abbreviated CFG, is a four-tuple, okay? uh, V sigma RS, where what? V is a finite set of variables, okay? some set of variables. Uh, sigma is a finite set of terminals, and this is like the input alphabet, okay, is the alphabet over which um, your language is, is defined. And R is a finite set of rules where each rule is of the type A goes to W, where A is a variable, and W is some combination of variables and terminals, okay, V union sigma star. And then you're going to start somewhere. So we specify, just like for the DFA, we specify the start node. Here we specify a start variable. So S is a specific variable in V, which is a start variable. Here is an example. The language A to the M, B to the N, where M is bigger than N, is described by the following context-free grammar. The variables are S and T. S is a start variable. The terminals are A and B. And the rules are S goes to AS or AT, and T goes to ATB or Epsilon. Let's give, a, let's give an example of how we're going to derive a string like AAAB. We start with the start 
um, variable, and then which rule are we going to apply? Any guesses? We're first going to apply the rule AS. This allows us to throw in one more, one more A, and then we're still, we still have S. Then what? Then we're going to um, switch to T. I'm going to apply the second rule. We have now A, A, T. Okay, and then at this point, I can use T just like before to have the same number of A's and B's. Okay, so I do it once, you get A, 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 T, B, and then again, A, 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 B, uh, by using the T goes to Epsilon rule. Okay, this is another example of a language that's not regular, but is context-free. Okay, it has a context-free grammar. Uh, remember, we saw with the pumping lemma that even recognizing this language cannot be done by a DFA, but we just gave a context-free grammar for it. Okay, let's now be precise of how a context-free grammar computes. Okay, remember for DFA, we were precise, we said, you know, uh, DFA accepts the string if you can find a sequence of states such that some conditions are, are a hold, some conditions hold, okay? There was, we had a trace of states that you go through, okay? And a similar thing uh, we're going to do now for context-free grammars. Um, so uh, if you have a context-free grammar, we are going to write um, U, a V yields U W V if you can replace A with W. Okay. You can do that if A goes to W is a rule. Okay. And we say that U derives V, and this is written uh, uh, U yields star V. Okay. If Okay, the trivial case is if u is equal to v, okay, you don't do anything. This would be the case in which the star is the epsilon string here, so you don't apply any rule. Or you can find a sequence of strings, u1, u2, uk, such that u yields u1, u1 yields u2, u2 and so on until UK and UK is V, okay? And the language of the grammar is written as L of G is a set of strings, okay? Just middle terminals, such that S derives them, okay? The language of the grammar is a set of strings that can be derived from S. Okay, and just to be clear, uh, here W should be an element of sigma star. Okay, so these strings are just made of terminals. And we're going to give this important definition. Now, we say that a language L is context free if there exists a grammar G whose language is L. Okay, remember that we defined regular languages in terms of automata. And now instead we are going to define context-free languages in terms of grammars. Let's give an example, okay? This is a slightly more complicated example. We are in working now with alphabet over three symbols, zero, one pound, and pound is going to play an important role later on. And we want a context-free grammar for the language um, of strings x pound y, where x and y are just zeros and ones, and their lengths are different. Okay, seems like a complicated thing, but actually such things will play a very important role later in undesirability. So you want the strings uh, which have a pound and on the left and on the right have some sequence of zeros and ones, and these two sequences have different lengths, okay? I claim that this is a grammar that 
derives that language. So it's useful sometimes if you want to understand a grammar to explain what each piece does. Okay, so you write, you go one by one each variable and you ask yourself, what does this variable derive? Okay, so let's start and let's do it. What does B derive? What's the language of B? Think about it. Remember, I'm gonna pause here. When you see the question mark, you can pause the video and you can ask yourself, you know, can I do this? Okay, so the B derives zero and B derives one. Okay, so either zero, one, the, the, the set is zero or one. What about A? So A, in A, I, I, I can put any Bs to the left and to the right, or I can do a pound. So what does A derive? It derives strings of the type x pound y, where the length of x and length of y are the same, okay? Because if you put a b here, you have to put a b there as well. And each b can become a 0, 1 independent tree. What about r? Well, in r, you can do like b, you were doing before, okay? Or you can go back to r and then do a B. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that you can pump arbitrarily the length on the right. Okay? So R derives, R is for right, as you may have guessed, the strings of the type X upon Y, where the length of X is less than, the, is at most than the length of Y. L is symmetric, is the same thing but symmetric. So the language of L is the language of X upon Y, where the length of X is at least the length of Y. Now, what happens? We want these two lengths to be different, right? So let's make either one strictly bigger than the other or the other one strictly bigger, okay? So from the start variable, I can do RB. That will correspond to what? That will correspond to the language of strings, X upon Y, where the length of X is strictly less than the length of Y. Symmetrically, uh, S goes to BL, right? This would derive the set of strings, X upon Y, where the length of X is, is at least the length of why? So the language of L is L, okay? Because at the beginning, you get to choose who's going to be bigger, X or Y, okay? And then you can derive any string of the type. Okay, so they can be complicated and it's useful to write down each variable what strings it generates. And here is another example for a context-free grammar for expressions in programming languages. Okay, here the task would be to recognize strings like you know zero plus zero plus one times one plus zero, and so on. Okay, and here is a grammar that would do that. Um, it only has one variable. S goes to S plus S or S times S, or open bracket S, close, back, close bracket, or zero or one. So if you want to derive this string here, you go uh, from S to S plus S, uh, then I can put uh, the first zero here. I can use this, this rule S goes to zero for that first zero. Then I'm gonna expand for, uh, further this S in S plus S, okay? The second S here will, will again become a, a zero. And this S here is going to be expanded with the rule S times S. Okay. This first S is going to become a, a one with, with the rule S goes to one. And now I need to put the brackets. So I'm going to use the rule 
S goes to open bracket S close bracket uh, to replace this S here with open bracket S cl close bracket. Then I'm going to further expand that S into S plus S. And then I'm going to replace the first S with, with a one and the second S with a zero. This is a string just made of terminals, the string in my language. Uh, so this is, this is an example of a grammar that would um, derive such expressions, which are very commonplace in programming languages. And of course, jumping ahead, uh, the compiler or a human being also wants to get some meaning out of this expression. And, uh, you know, the way through that uh, is to basically use the rules to infer the meaning. Okay, uh, so if you put plus, it means that, that you're summing things, or times means that you're multiplying things. And several aspects um, are important now. Uh, for example, you know, if there are multiple derivations, it's not clear what you meant, right? This is, um, it's not clear if you meant to do a plus or a times first. And this has to do with uh, uh, ambiguity, which is a concept that we're going to explore next. For now, uh, this is it. I will see you next time.